Thank you so much for um, on your day off for doing this interview with me. Uh, I really appreciate it as a fan of your work. I have a ton of things I want to talk to you about, which runs the gamut of uh, subjects. Um, but I want to start with congrats on Raging Fire being a huge box office success in China and around the world. Um, congratulations. Thank you very much. If someone had never seen one of your movies, what movie would you like them to start with? I made so many movies. I, I've been around for ages. I'm a dinosaur, especially as an action filmmaker. You know, I I act and I produce and I direct. And I mean, I, I my my fingers they don't they don't know what I am. You know, when they think of Donnie Yen as is I is, is, you know the martial art actor, uh, but in 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 my country, I'm I'm the, I'm, I'm who I am that runs from. Acting, producing, you know, I, I sometimes I sing a little bit, you know, cameo in my my friends' uh, films, and I do all kinds of things. You know, I just love the art of uh, the artistic uh, world, and very privileged and fortunate that uh, what has been given to me in my last forty years in the business. I was very. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't take anything for granted. I'm a very lucky man. And I'm able to do this for business as well as having fun, utilizing uh, a little bit of these artistic value that I have to, for my movie. So, yeah. So you don't, so, you don't, have, a spe- you don't have a specific movie. I don't you know. have a specific. I mean, if I tell people, oh, watch it, man. And they think, oh, Donnie is it, man. Well, I, I think, if, but then you can watch Chasing the Dragon. I don't know if you've seen Chasing the Dragon when I played uh, a drug lord in gangster mode. Or if you watch Flashpoint, it's totally opposite, different character. It Man is introvert, grandmaster, kung fu, talks slow, walks slow. He doesn't want to fight, but he can kick your butt, right? But then Flashpoint is more like totally aggressive, fired up, passionate, bites your head off, you know? So I don't know. So if, I guess you got to see at least two movies <laughs> to see the contract, <laughs> at least two movies. Got it. So I say, you know, watch it, man. And watch, watch Killzone, SPL, Flashpoints, you know, watch, watch John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, um, so far I'm having, I, you know, I have to take this opportunity to my utmost uh, appreciation for both Chad and Akeonu. They're just very lovely men. You know, they just gentlemen, got a big heart. Akeonu got a wonderful, just got a good soul. You know, this is a good man. And Chad, also a very good man. Very knowledgeable. People think him is just a, a brilliant action guy. No, he's not. He understands films. He, you know, he's a film librarian. He knows what's, what's going on. And, 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 and yeah, so I, I just having the best time, best time working with them in this movie than any of my previous uh, Hollywood movies. So I, I wanted to uh, ex- 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 express my, uh, my appreciation. Well, the other thing is um, I've, I've been on the set of a, of a John Wick movie. And I think a lot of people maybe they just don't realize that Keanu is really, really talented at doing action himself. And he really pushes himself on a level that is, you know, most people might not do. I mean, you do, but he is very talented. Oh, he is great. He's just more than I, it's ex, more than I was uh, ex, expected. He, the guy is like, does everything himself. And he put in the hours, he put in the work and he can do it. He's no joke, you know, and the guy's like, my, I've got to have that respect for him. And he, and he's just a cool guy to be around, to work with, you know. I've been on the set, a different movie where he just rode up on his motorcycle, yeah. you know, just casual, no big deal. Yeah, yeah, love the man. He's a lovely, he got a very gentle, soul, lovely soul, you know, wonderful soul. Completely. Jumping back into, you're in a unique position because I would imagine a lot of people want to be in business with you. But is there a project 
throughout your career or now that you've always been wanting to make and for some reason you've never been able to get the financing? I mean, I think every actor or every filmmaker has a couple of these desirable projects in their heart or desirable characters, right? And I had a quite a number of those in my earlier days. But out of my long, been around for ages career, I've been in the business for 40 years and made, making my 80, 80s films, right? 80s film. I don't really have, I'm not that, uh, how would I call it? I, I mean, I'm ambitious as, as far as I'm a perfectionist. If I decide to do some, uh, do a movie or, or tackle a role, I try to do the best I can, right? With no doubts, I don't, no punches. I, you know, I, same with Keanu, you know, I throw my body into the, to the freaking shithole if I need, if I needed to, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I need to, I got to get the job done. You know, I don't, and I come, I don't sleep. I don't come home 24 seven. I'm constantly thinking about what I did and what I'm going to do next day. Right. That's just my, always been, always been my work ethics. I believe that's, I have to tribute to myself, you know, that's, but at the same time, I don't really have, I'm not desirable as like some actors like, you know what? Oh, I never played that role before. Let me try to play that role. I don't have that kind of, uh, that uh, animosity or that, that kind of uh, appetite. You know, I don't have that. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I'm not here to, oh, let me prove myself. No, but I am very ambitious in terms of, I am uh, for the longest time, I do want to represent as a Chinese character, as a Chinese actor, and and represent, uh, yeah, my my culture, my Chinese culture, my roots. Which for the longest time I believe, and you, and most people can't disagree with me, that uh, in the in the film industry. But if you're talking about the global, you know, bigger than that, it's not just the film industry. But for the most part. Most of the a majority of people in the world doesn't truly understand the beauty of my culture or the talents that what our uh, the, the the beauty of our culture, our, the, what we can do for the world. And in this conversation specifically for film, we have a lot of talented actors, but unfortunately in a lot of American films, Asian actor, Chinese actor in specific, Never was given the opportunities. The other day I watched another film, right? I scanned through a film while we're talking about the subject, about the ghost, uh, the shell in the ghost, uh, the ghost in the shell, right? Oh yeah, ghost in the shell. It's, it's, it's an Asian, I mean, you know, come on, you know? I don't understand, but why is the Chinese actors are always uh, stereotyped? When you cast a Chinese actor, he's always got to, his name got to be Chinese, I mean, he's, he got to act a certain way that in a Western culture would think, oh, this is how, presumably how Chinese act. But, and, but never really, uh, never really, uh, really dig, in, dig, dig deep inside of what this person is about. It's the person, not whatever they look like, right? So for, for me, as a Chinese actor, I wanted to, to break that. I want to be the person that to do something about it. You know, that's why I'm constantly discuss and, and try to, to, uh, to fight for a better, uh, understand like in Rogue One, when they asked me to do Rogue One, it wasn't like, like that. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, Asian elements and a lot of Chinese elements in it, you know, with my martial arts and, and the costume and everything, but it was, but it, it added humanity. It had it added humans it added a little bit different from what you expect and that was a progression of of uh what it should what it should be uh been seen for the longest time right so and with this role i i believe this is another groundbreaking role for for a uh yeah that's a per that's my personal journey that's the kind of roles that i want to play to represent you know I've said repeatedly that Hollywood can do a much better job with representation from around the world than they currently do. But I, I feel 
as someone looking at it from the outside, that they are making better inroads recently, but it's still not enough. I look at, for example, Marvel having getting ready to release, you know, Shang Chi, um, which uh, you know, hopefully that is something you know that's an Asian cast. Um, are you planning? Is that something that you're looking forward to, the Shang Chi, the the Marvel movie? I I I mean, there's a lot of uh, I I still I think on a, to be fairness, right? They they tried, but not hard enough. You're talking about not the Marvel? Oh, they, you mean overall, Hollywood? Oh, over, yeah. overall, overall, they tried, but they're not catching up. Like, um, let me give you an example, right? How many good Chinese restaurant you find in LA? Not in the Chinese community, but in the other community. How many? You have to think uh, about it. <laughs> and, and those Chinese uh, restaurants, they're not really authentic. So, but to them, that's authentic. So what I'm uh, trying to say is like, what I'm trying to say is like, have they done the research with the culture, with the language, with how we dress, how we talk. I can give you my personal experience. I don't want to talk about, I don't want to put anybody down, you know, given, you know, uh, I'm, not, I'm not here to talk, I'm not here to criticize other people's, uh, uh, you know, I appreciate what they've done, you know, to putting, they certainly a milestone uh, progression compared to say 10, 20 years ago, right? But my hat off. Salute to that. But at the same time, there's still so much they could do from my personal experience. I did a film, a couple, a couple of films, I'm not going to talk about which film, where the director would actually don't even understand how to hold the chopstick, but he's directing a Chinese, you know, you know, it's so, like this little crazy things, you know, the way just, I'm not, I'm not really respecting the importance of these details. These details is how you progress and it should progress that way, right? So, yeah. And I, before I retire, I would like to make a few of those, those films to, to really, uh, to express my, uh, my, my, my thinking. Well, it's interesting because you directed earlier in your career and obviously you action direct now and you, you know, that that's a whole different chapter, but you actually directed uh, yeah. a few movies. So yeah. I am wondering, is that something that you, do you think with your, um, with who you are and your name that maybe directing something in the future, which is a melting pot of China and Hollywood in a way that maybe you're uniquely suited to merge these two entities? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say specifically directing the whole films, you know. I've directed completely back in 19, mid 90s. I did, uh, directed a few films. Actually, I never stopped directing. And many of the films that I myself involved in many of the Chinese film where I produced, I, I basically just, a lot of those stuff were directed by me. But I wouldn't want to, I want to focus off, you can only do so much, right? I, I think directing a complete movie would kill me. You know, would age me another 10 years, right? So, but I, I definitely, my, I'm very hands-on person, what, whichever position that I'm in in the, in the film, whether I'm producing or just, if you see the title of me acting, like just acting only, right? Without other titles on it. But I'm always known to be very passionate about the subjects and the materials and, I will constantly, uh, I'm not going to lose that, right? Before I retire, you know, every movie that I ongoing, I'm going to try to push what I feel is correct or appropriate or, you know, what makes a better material, makes a re better representation. I'll always voice out, you know, so, yeah. But as far as directing an entire film, probably not. Got it. I've, I've heard that from a number of people. Um, I am a huge fan of Jackie Chan. I know you obviously respect and love Jackie Chan. Uh, I am curious, do you have a favorite Jackie Chan movie and a favorite Jackie Chan stunt? Well, it, well of course, his classic was way back uh, uh, with my mentor, Yu Mo Ping, when he, he, Yu Mo Ping discovered me, right? And it's very, very classic, like Snake in the Eel Shadows and Drunken. Uh, master, uh, that's where I personally feel was Jackie's 
prime, prime, right? But later on, he also came up with police story and projects they were those crazy stunts, you know, that really revolutionized and put a stamps on the world as, wow, you got the Hong Kong film, action filmmakers, that's how we do films, you know, the way, I mean, think about it. Not we were crazy and they're crazy and, and, and innovative, but at the same time, we were wildly unorganized. Basically, we imp- a lot of these choreographies were improvised on the set and decided to, to do it on the set, <laughs> you know? And, and then it became kind of a part of history. No matter how much praise Jackie gets, it's never enough for what he's done for movie making. Absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, the, he's, the, he's a big brother. You know, he's done, and he's still very active, you know, very active producing, and he always uh, falls back on his roots, you know. I, you touched on Rogue One for a second, and I just want to go back to it. When you think back on the making of the movie, what's like the first thing you think about? Did, did it mean a lot to you to be part of Star Wars? Um, In the beginning, no. I, I didn't know how uh, significant, uh, how influential. I mean, I, of course, I know Star Wars big. As for, you know, I didn't follow Star Wars. I didn't watch every episode. So when they came in and called on me, uh, I wasn't sure that I was gonna, I was, I got offers for other movies at the time and I wasn't sure because I didn't want to leave my family for that long. And it ended up really long plus the reshoot. It ended up like taking like nine months, eight, nine months out of my life in London, right? But I, did, I didn't know what to expect. I saw the materials and, and, and I needed to make, make some adjustment before I say yes. And, and Lucasfilm, uh, Disney, and, and the, the director were, uh, were very, very gracious. And he allowed me to make some cha- changes to satisfy my certain, the terms. You know, okay, if I do this role, this, you're going to let me do this. And it turns out, and then it became so popular and everybody, I didn't know what to expect. You know, was, a lot of these lines were improvised. You know, I'm a Chinese, I'm a Hong Kong filmmaker from the old days where we improvised a lot. So, I mean, I wasn't improvising fully, but I try to push my limit. You know, I try to see what I can do. And one day I improvised one, two lines and directed, oh, this, this, that was funny. And then they liked it and put in the, you know, the one when they put the bag over me and I said, hey, you know, you know, something like I'm blind, I'm blind, you know, certain, just things like little things like that, you know. But yeah, I mean, I'm glad it did. It became, well, my, my, my kids loved it. <laughs> I, 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 also, um, I also really enjoy that movie. And considering the reshoots it went through, it's so good considering how much, you know, that movie just went through a lot. You know, sometimes the audience doesn't understand. Uh, most audience doesn't understand when they just, you know, pay their tickets and they go see a watch and film. It's so easy to sit back and say, you know, this is a great movie. Okay, great. Or oh, this is a shitty movie. But they don't understand what happened <laughs> throughout the process. Right? It takes so much, so many people doing so many decisions on a daily basis, every little details. So at the end of the day, you might have the best script or the best idea. And the end of the day, it might be crap. Or the other way, you might have a loosely, like everybody is insecure about oh, what's going to happen. You know, we don't have a script. We don't have this. We don't have that. You know, well, some of these most classic films were made that way. Some of the most, not just Chinese films, a lot of these Chinese films were made that way. It was made out of last minute decision of, oh, let's do this movie. Put these actors together, put it in a room, no script. What are we going to do? What are we going to say? And next day, now you have these classes. I think some of the American movies were, were kind of put together that way. I'm not suggesting that's the best way to do it, you know. Of course, we need a plan and organization, you know, especially the, the industry is, is not as, it's, it's not as, it's not as great as, as the prime days, right? So everybody got to watch their budgets and stuff like that, right? But I think just we need to find balance and understand film is ultimately is a business, but at the same time, it needs to be 
artistically, uh, uh, you gotta have the artist, artistic uh, kind of space for us to to expand, to do our thing, you know, and not restrict us. Like, okay, you gotta shoot five shots here. You gotta finish two sets. Uh, you can't. You gotta allow the the artist to be to a bit of uh, the freedom there, you know. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I, a lot of people don't realize that movies are ultimately art their artwork but they're also designed to make money so the it's such a tricky balance because you know you want you have to re return the investment of how, you know but you also want to make something that no one's seen before that entertains yeah, it's, yeah. it's a very tricky thing very very tricky it's 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 an it's an a knowledge is an art form that even the most experienced maestro filmmakers cannot win every Every single time. I mean, I mean, who can say that every one of their films are successful film and make money? None of them. Right? The greatest, the biggest director, biggest actor in the world have some failed films, right? <laughs> that didn't work, right? So, yeah. I know you're a fan of Chow Young Fat. I am also a fan. I constantly debate which is my favorite between The Killer and Hard Boiled. Do you have a favorite between The Killer and Hard Boiled, or are they both equal? I think for, I call him Brother Fat, like Big Brother Fat, John Fat. I think my favorite is two of his, not, not Killer. The Killer is a stylistic film. It's the structure, the way, it's, that character is cool. It's written that way. It's given to that. But I, I, I was better, I was more, a lot more impressed by Better Tomorrow. Where, by the way, he wasn't written as the lead. If you didn't know the backstory, the backstory was that he wasn't even, he, his role was small and it was not given to him. It was, it was written for another actor, but, but when he came to work, he just came to work and be who he was. And it was this low point of his career. And sometimes when a person is, when you're down, that raging fire is in you, <laughs> you fight. So he was there and he came and he was so impressive that John was start writing, expanding his role and he, he became, he stole the role, he stole the movie. And that's how he became huge, right? From that film. So from that film, he did a couple other, uh, other film, uh, non-action, but more of a uh, romantic uh, kind of role, right? That I thought it was very impressive. But Killer is more stylistic, especially during that time, you know, between, uh, during the, the, the period, you know, it, it broke rounds. Hot Boy was just, people had never seen John Foss work, his previous film. You just look at Hot Boy, it's like, wow, that's great. But when you look at Better Tomorrow or some of his other work, they were even more impressive. I, I think The Killer and Hard Boiled have a special place in my heart because those were, I think, the first two films I saw of his and John Woo. And I just was uh -huh. like, what? I was like, oh my God. This is just melting my brain. This is unbelievable. You know, so I think, you know, I saw that at a young age. And uh, anyway, that's it. So jumping into why I actually get to talk to you, which is Raging Fire. Um, before we go any further in this movie, I sort of want to just touch on, you know, Benny Chan and how he passed, uh, you know, making this film. Can you sort of talk about um, what he meant to you and, you know, what he contributed to filmmaking um, in Asia? I know Benny from... 20 something years ago, we collaborated in a t two TV series. Uh, at the time it was for a TV station called ATV, which was the underdog. Uh, and we broke ground. It became very classic TV series at the time and all the high rating. But then after, since then, we never worked together. He went on to do other films, directed Jackie, and I went on to do my films. But we always, always cross path in common studios where I edit my films and he edits films. And we always talk about what we're going to do next and when are we going to do next, right? Just chitty chat, chat you know? And then uh, a few years ago, uh, he called me up and he said he just saw Chasing the Dragon where I played that drug lord guy, right? And he really loved my performance. Oh, he was so great. And, you know, when are we going to do this together? And then uh, he came up with this passionate uh, storyline concept and originally we weren't going to do raging fire we're going to do this movie in mexico and him and some of my assistants my stunt team 
went with him and his team for location scouting. He's, we spent a lot of pre-production money in Mexico. And then he came back and he got a call from the film company saying that uh, they want to put, put that project on hold because the movie costs a, a lot more. So Benny was really down for a week or two. And, and I, was, I actually was the one that encouraged him. I said, you know, this is what you do best. You do local cop movies. This is what you do. You know, Benny Chan, uh, one of the film that he did earlier is called, uh, is it something? Anyway, you gotta dig up the, the English title, right? And, and I said, you know, you could do a low budget and story can be, you know, involved. So he came up with the storyline within, uh, within a, in a week or two, you know, and he called me up, hey, this is what we're gonna do. So, and, and we, of course, throughout the pro process, we, we kept changing back and forth. So came to back and forth with the story uh, of the cast and how we're gonna shoot this. And we both were very, um, we had, we were both very um, fired up. We wanted to kind of revise, revive the, the Hong Kong action, especially this type of film, which is like, you talked about the killer, you talked about the hot boy. We wanted to, but we haven't seen this kind of strong, dramatic, uh, heated up action happening in Hong Kong for years. So we wanted to do something like that. And I haven't done this. For, for me, after 13 years of playing It Man, four episodes, people forgot that I, before It Man, I did Flashpoint and I did Killzone and those films. They, 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 those are the films that I'm actually passionate about, contemporary, that kind of style, right? So, so we hit it off and we wanted to do that. And then, uh, and then so we did, we, we just tackled it. And unfortunately, when we, after, after we finished the film, I went to LA and attended the uh, Mulan premiere. And I and he had three, week, uh, three months to edit the, the director cut. So we, we kind of uh, agreed on how we're gonna work things. He's gonna have his cut, director cuts, he's gonna show me, cause I'm one of the producers as well, right? So he's shown me his cut and I'm gonna have my input. Not only the action, but overall, right? So I wanted to give him the input here and maybe cut, do my version of editing and then give it back to him. And that's how we've been working uh, for four or five months. And then I got a call from him and one day, now all these times we were communicating through phone calls. Like he would send his team, he would have a cut, like he got a new cut after say two weeks or three weeks. He would send over to my company, uh, my film company in Hong Kong and with his AD and, and his, the editor and we would edit in my, in my uh, company. But then we can only, we were exchanging our thoughts through phone, and I was finding very strange in the first four, 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 or five months. Then he called me one day, and said, "You know, I'm sick. I caught it." I said, what, what, "What's going on?" You know, and he got cancer. He was diagnosed with cancer, but he was very optimistic about it, right? And then we were very encouraging to all his surrounding. He was very positive. He said, "Oh, you know, I'm doing everything. I'm doing this, this therapist, you know, this, this treatment, and here and there, you know." But he did express. It was, it was very painful and he couldn't eat. He lost a lot of weight. And I mean, it was so painful that, that he had never felt in his, in his entire life, right? But we were very encouraging uh, and not thinking that he wouldn't survive, right? And then uh, I think the month and a month before he passed away, we, 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 called, we had a call and his condition was going down. And then, and then we, I continue to encourage him and I recommend an, another doctor to him. And he was, one thing I remember mostly that every time we talk, despite of, I mean, basically man is dying. And he, only he talks about is how to make Raging Fire better. You know what I'm saying? Like exchange, he was so, he loved movie making. All we talked about was just, how do you make this cut or this scene? And if we change that shot to that shot, if you change that 
dialogues to that one, you know, or taking the scene from this scene. So we're constantly playing with that kind of puzzle, right? Putting the film together. So that's what I remember the most, you know, he was very, uh, the man loved movies more than his own life, I, I guess, you know I mean? And then uh, one day I got a call from my uh, company's uh, manager and she called me and said, oh, Benny's in the uh, ICU. You, you should call him, you know, he's, he's not doing well, he's leaving. And I hung up and news, the news came up, he passed away, just like that. That was a very a big, a very big loss of uh, the whole entire uh, Chinese film industry. I um I appreciate you sharing that story, and um, I'm really sorry for your loss and for his friends and family. Um, you know, uh, at least I I try to look at you know a celebration of life, and at least he was doing something that he was passionate about and he loved. You know, uh, Steve, uh, I I. I I never stopped thinking about that since he passed away. He passed away without a final cut. I helped him to continue to, uh, to finish cutting. I keep cutting and post-production and me and another, there was a couple other guys like working on fixing the dialogue we read up the dialogues, you know, Chinese film, and Nick read up his dialogues just to make, change a couple of lines here and there, you know, that's the way we make films, we change lines all the time, right? So we just to make it better, constantly making it perfections, you know, I, we want to do Benny justice. And the film came out, we've been number one, whatever the reason, you know, uh, been number one, print. but you know what, he's not here to, to to cherish, he's not here to take that applause, you know, that that praise, you know, he, he's not here. He doesn't know. I mean, that is the, the tragic behind it. When I look at it, this is deeper than the film itself, you know, it's the tragic. I never stopped thinking to, to today. Every, every once, uh, once in a, uh, a while, I would think, you know, we're focusing on this film, we're still tracking the box office. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because the man who directed the film, he's not here. He doesn't know. You know, he's, does, it, does it matter to the family? You know, obviously not, right? It's, that's not important. What is important is like, life is short, you know? I mean, this is profound, right? This is like deep, you know? This is some, another object, another subject, right? So I don't, I don't know, you know, sometimes I have a mixed feeling of what is, what is this about, you know? Like on one hand, we, 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 we risk our life doing the, the things that we love. But on the other hand, life is so precious. Why are we risking our life? <laughs> you, know? you, you understand what I'm saying? Listen, I, I have this, I, in the last few years, I've personally lost a number of people close to me. I, I'm sure you have also lost people close yes, to you I like have. Me yes, and, and others. Yeah. And the only thing that I've learned as I've gotten older is to not let things bother me the way they used to and to cherish each day and yeah. to just look, if it makes you happy, you know, I know you're risking your life for making movies, but it's clearly something you love to do. And, you know, what else, you know, th it, there's no good answer. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to get philosophical, but you know, <laughs> it's, there's, there's no, you, you know what I mean? Not easy. Not easy, Steve. I mean, I'm here, I'm stuck in Berlin. I was like, I'm making this film, you know, I wish they can speed up the process as much as I love Chad and Kim, you know, it's taking too long, you know, it's like, God damn, you know, I, I miss my kids, I miss my wife, I want to go home, I want to, you know, every day where I'm sitting here, you know, I mean, they take care of, they could take good care of me, but at the same time, look, you know, I want to be with my family, you know, what the hell am I doing? Does your family never travel with you when you're going to be on location? No, they travel, it's just my kids have school. Oh yeah, and there's quarantines, you know. I mean, there's there's all kinds of situations going on. The world's not easy nowadays, you know. So, but the fact that I'm uh, the 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 simple fact that I'm like half around the world, you know, like thousand, few thousand miles away from my kids, you know, the times are different. I, when I call my kids, they be asleep, or when they call me, I'm like out of out of bed or whatever, you know. I mean, I don't. My kids are growing up by the day, right? and I miss my wife, you know, and I, I, I feel so guilty that 
she got to take care of my film company because we want a film company together, right? She got to run everything in the company. She got to take care of the kids and she got to do everything. I'm, yes, it's not easy to make films, right? But at the same time, this is the only thing I, I need to do <laughs> is to do to do, make films. Well, my other half, my missus, got to do a million things, you know? So in a way, I, and I feel really guilty. I want to take part for having that responsibility as, as, as a father and a husband. I think you're a very good man. And I think that uh, it shows where you, the right priorities are. I also think though, that John Wick is also such a huge thing around the world. It's such a popular franchise that, you know, there's also the element of, you know, being part of a film like this also helps you with other projects and maybe get other things seen because, you know, more people will learn who you are by being part of John Wick. So for my personal uh, interest and my personal achievement, you're absolutely right. You know, this is something that, uh, especially, Knowing, luckily, uh, fortunately, I'm working with people like Chad and Kim. You know, is 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 that's a blessing, right? Yes, <laughs> but you know, like I was saying, you know, you, I'm a family man. You know, I, I want to be with my my family. I'm not trying to say, say uh, be sentimental with you in this particular sentimental moments, but I've been feeling that way for the longest times. Not saying I'm retiring soon, but <laughs> maybe. But it's all, it's also because you've been uh, probably doing a lot of night shoots, and that plays with your it messes with your head doing night shoots. I, I don't think it's 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 what I've been doing. It's what I've been thinking for before this movie. You know, for I think it's just many things that's happening in the world. You know, uh, with very close, like Benny passed away, my father-in-law passed away uh, uh, last year. You know, very dear. It's like a father to me, you know. What I mean, so I have some friends who's also passed passed away, good friends uh, in the past few years, you know. The and the older I get, and I, I don't know why we're talking about this. We should be talking about movies, promoting movies, making. But I think the truth is because both you and I in the last few years have been going through similar things in our own yes. way, and I think we can both pick up on that because I've lost a number of very close people to me the last yeah, few years. Well, let's, let's move past this talk. And um, specifically, I want to talk to you because you are an expert action director. You have crafted so many sequences. And I'm very curious how you um, get ready for a shoot in terms of, okay, so say you're going to do Raging Fire and you know you're going to be filming, let's say, on March 1st. This is an arbitrary day. How early on are you breaking down the action that you would like to have happen in the movie? Are you pre vising Are you storyboarding? Can you sort of take me through your process? I never did from day one. And I'm getting and I'm to a point where it's, people have to understand that. I have a different way of process art, especially when the physical art, uh, choreography. I learned that very early on. I learned the way I function in my mind when I work with Yumo Peng as his action director from Tiger Cage, from, you know, even once upon a time with uh, China when I fought Jet Li and, you know, I Monkey and all those when I was collaborating with him and I was helping him choreograph. Obviously, there's a certain function to it. There's a certain fundamental mechanic behind this, right? Because you got to be technically, you got to be knowledgeable, you got to be able to do it, you got to understand how it works. But at the end of the day, it's about expression. I don't mean it sound philosophical, it's about expression. How do you express the, ultimately, is the audience receiving, you know? And from time after time and after time where, when people look at my scene and they respond to, with, 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 with uh, this impressive uh, response. And, and I started to understand, oh, it's all about getting a reaction from the audience, getting that, oh, you know? So basically it comes down to a couple of things. It's, it's deliveries, it's expression. It's uh, like, like singing a song, playing a piece of music. How do I get you emotionally involved? And in, in, and in this particular, uh, genre, action film, how do you get you excited? How do you get you excited? 
if you're gonna if you're gonna throw if you're gonna choreograph something like this, about two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then you're gonna edit it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Obviously, you're not gonna be excited, right? Because we're human. We respond to the signal of you know turning it on, right? So for me, early on was tempo, was rhythm, was pacing. How do I choreograph where there's an element of surprise? There's the highlight, and then there's the end. That's the early chain of thought, my early career when I direct and choreograph. And later on, as I discovered about, you know, I've been in business 40 years. For the first 20 years as an actor, truthfully, I didn't know what the hell I was doing as an actor. I didn't know what the hell I was doing as an actor, honestly, because I was so focused on wanting to be the best action guy I mean, frankly speaking, in the beginning, I didn't know, I, I didn't, I had no intention of being an actor. I was discovered by Yumo Ping because he thought I was, he wanted to have an, an next Jackie Chan. He created Jackie Chan. He made Jackie Chan famous by making Drunken Master uh, and Stake in the Eagle Shadow. They split up. Jackie went to Golden House. So truthfully, Yumo Ping was not too happy. So he said, I'm going to make another Jackie Chan. Let me look for another young guy, right? He was scouting around for, for a few years. Then somehow Destiny called on me and because my mom teaches martial arts, uh, she's a martial art master. One of the, her old student, older students, when she was teaching in Hong Kong before we moved to live in Boston and open up a school in Boston, one of her, te- one of her students was Yumo Peng's elder sister. So she told him that, oh, this is kid, I was six, 17 at the time. You know, this, this, this kid is really like, you, you should check, check him out. So I saw him at 18, got a little screen test, show him what I could do. He's like, and we made our first two movies together. That's how I was brought into the industry. I have no idea, no proper training in drama. And fr- uh, truthfully sp- speaking, a lot of those old time action directors, you know, they weren't too focus on the drama department if you know what i'm saying right so i was not taught properly and guided properly and asked how to be a good uh actor and my personal journey and my personal ambitions was i just want to be the nick bruce lee you know the best action actor i could be and the best action director because they go hand in hand for you to become an action uh, uh best action guy obviously beside your talent Someone got to direct you and, and make you the best, right? So, you know what? Why don't I do it myself? So I started learning how to direct and cuts, you know? And then I became a pretty, pretty uh, uh, influential direct, uh, action director. But then later on, I reached to a certain point where, you know, how much can I go? As, how far can I go? The industry already recognized me. Oh, Donnie Yen's the man. He's the, the guy that can, he's the best action guy, right? But then what is the, what do I want to do for an industry? You know, if you wanted to carry that message, if you wanted to pass the knowledge of share your uh, creative uh, world, right? You need more people to see that what you're doing. It's not just a niche of people. You're not making a movie to show yourself. So all this action direction and choreography that I was doing, I was not, I was not a popular style in that regards i'm not jackie chan i'm not jet lee i couldn't let people see more people to see what i could do so i said you know what how can i make myself to that level i gotta be a better actor right i gotta be an over actor where i generate mass audience then i started studying about oh you know then i started to focus more of the actors department then then it came man then it came other bodyguards and disaster that's then 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 i slowly discovered the love of drama acting and then real, and then and switch, kind of switch my path as an action guy to a true. I call myself a true actor. You know, I'm not I'm not a Robert De Niro, but I certainly know what is good acting. And in the past ten years, if you if you realize, a lot of these action, I don't put focus on action anymore. I put put uh, focus on the character because I understand if the audience are connected with your the character that you created and better, better yet, if they love your character, they're gonna love everything you do. Even if you, your kick is not as sharp as 
what you used to do 10 years ago. That doesn't matter because people are going to be on your side cheering for you, right? So it's all about character. You build that character. Of course, the, the script, the story has to give you, the, set you up where the audience kind of stand for you and, and you build that up. It Man was a very good example. When people emotionally attach to my character, when I fight, they, oh, you know, we want Master uh, It Man to, to win, right? So, yeah. So that's, that's, I don't think about action anymore. I think of, I have my guys to choreograph. Before I was very specific. I'm sorry, I, I kind of skipped so many uh, deep. I give you the specific answer to your questions. The specific answer was back in the days, I was a perfectionist as far as having the martial art technique down to the teeth. This martial art technique has to be this way, this block that way. You have to shoot a certain way, that way. Everything has to be the way I wanted it exactly. And I push for that. And later on, I just kind of, to, to, and then now the way I direct or choreograph, I think of what would this character do into, in this storyline? Would he encounter, uh, I'll give an example. If he walks in the room, he has to fight three guys. Why? Who are those guys? What's his emotion behind it? Then when I nail those down, I have a pretty much idea, a good idea of what I should do in this environment. And then I have my guys to come up with options. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, he could do this, jump over the table or kick this, blah, blah. But I'm naturally, the process of this choreography change is always in my head. I've been doing it all my life. So it's naturally, Oh no, he shouldn't kick here. He should kick the, he's this way. Right? So it's, I'm focusing on what the character would do, but at the same time, the technical choreography, it comes automatically. Uh, like a jazz, I'm a musician. I'm, I'm going into to, uh, jamming with my band. I know how to jam. And they give me a direction, what are we playing? Oh, let's stop playing, let's jam. Oh, maybe go this direction, go that direction. Sure. I think that your performance in Raging Fire is very good. And especially compared, obviously, to the beginning of your career, it is, um, you know, you, you've obviously progressed to becoming a much better actor. And it shows in Raging Fire. Well, I hope that you can see, uh, uh, have a chance to see my upcoming project. I didn't really focus too much on, I mean, I try to play a certain role with limitations in, in hands, understanding the, the nature of my role. Uh, finding that balance to, uh, to play a, a uh, flesh and, and, and blood grounded cop, like a train, a cops in that films that we all watched, like in Training Days, you know, and Denzel's and, and the Heats and Danilo and Al Pacino, of course, these are all great actors that, I, that motivates me. But at the same time, I understand the elements of, oh, they want to see a Donnie Yen film, they, Donnie Yen got to be this. So I got to find that balance to make him. Not all of a sudden he becomes an in-man master and then at the same time he's trying to be a grounded person. So I see the limitations there, right? So that was the, my, and I set the goal to achieve that, right? I really like it. I hope that you can see my other films that I've completed. It's, come, uh, it's a thriller, trauma, <clears throat> that really, really, uh, really I'm very proud of um, with, with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the personalities, you know? I was looking on your Instagram last night when I was prepping to talk to you. Yeah. And I saw you in China in a province yeah. where you said it was negative 20 degrees, yeah, which is yeah, yeah. very cold. Yeah, yeah. That is the, a defined moment for me as far as tackling the role. You know, that is, that is a role that to, to break grounds for my, for my own and as, the, as an actor. I am curious, what is the status of sleeping dogs? Because you've talked about that before, you know, based on the video game. Do you think that's going to happen? I'm still hopeful. I mean, they, every day they tell me it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm tell, I've been hearing from uh, my, my um, co-producing and collaborating with Neil Morris and Toby with, uh, uh, with their company and uh, currently with talking with a couple of uh, big platforms. So, and they tell me every single day it's going to happen. So we'll see. Like I said, I'm, I believe in destiny. So <laughs> if it's going to happen, hopefully happen the first half of next year. Can I ask you, what is it about that property 
um, that says, I want to make this? Is it, have you played the game? Do you, have you read a script that you really like? Honestly, it, it was like this. I did a very, I did a film that I'm not very proud of. <laughs> we all made some shitty films, right? I made a film called uh, uh, Iceman uh, a few years ago, right? One of the producers came to me and said, oh, you know, Donnie, I saw this game. This game is perfect for Sony game. And he showed me the, the cover. And the guy actually looked a little like what I did in my other films, right? And I looked at some of the clips, the way they fight. Hey, there's some of the, my moves. And, he, and then I did some research and I found some article saying that the person, this group of people who created this game, created the world, they want their fans are mine and they pretty much borrow some like actions and even the image, you know, kind of. And I said, oh, that's, that could be a fun vehicle because, like I said, I was caught in the 12, 13 years of the eight man image that I want to go back to action, contemporary action. And when I look at this material, I said, wow, this could be a perfect action, like contemporary action world. And I can I can do, and it's it's already have a uh, fan base, right? It it is uh, internal internal affair, infer, uh, to, uh, you know, flashpoint, uh, you know, it got all those elements, kind of like Rage and Fire, but even more edgier because I'm playing it undercover, so I could do so many things, right? It was very uh, at the time, it was very uh, you know, I was really uh, attracted to it. And then the, the rice went back and forth and back and forth and, and I tried to inquire to Sony's and, and it costed too much and they wanted too much money and it went back and forth and back for years, right? And then uh, I got a call from uh, the UMRS a few years ago. I said, they got the properties. Then we started talking and it's been a few years. We've been talking and talking and talking and talking. You know how slow it is. In Hong Kong, we make like five movies already, right? And we're still in discussion, you know? I do own the rights of the filmmaking. So I want to let you know that, right? I own the right, you know, and I have full intention and still wanted to do it. And, but how the story is going to go, uh, is it going to, is, is going to base on the, the game or uh, maybe some elements is we uh, uh, tracks, attracts uh, from the, the, from the games, but most likely you probably going to make, a more of a modern, like an updated version of, of Sleeping Dogs. But I'm still in every bit of in, in ambitions to, to want to make that because I invested many years of uh, kind of uh, uh, into, into this, this projects and, and I'm not backing out now. And they, and they, and they promised me, they, they tell me every day it's gonna happen. So we'll, hopefully it will happen. So, because I don't want to, Promise the fans and they, it's not going to happen, but it looks like it's going to happen. Is wait, did you say that you own the rights or Neil Moritz owns the rights? The movie making rights, uh, the making that right, this, this, I own the script. Okay, got it. I understand. But well, the other thing about the property is that, and, and maybe you agree with me and maybe you don't, I've always repeatedly said you need a cool title. And if sometimes these movies come out and they have a terrible title and it, it, it just, Immediately for me, I'm like, you could have done better. Sleeping Dogs is a good title. Yeah, Sleeping Dogs is good. Oh, by the way, I think I own the. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I want to address that. You know, I think I own the uh, uh, the movie making uh, uh, because there's a couple ownerships. I own the the title as well. Oh, so <laughs> yeah, you've gone full force. You're really you're serious. You you want to make well, this. you know, I mean. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, gonna do it. we're gonna do it all the way. We're gonna do it all the way, you know. Have you had any conversations with the game company about possibly if this thing gets off the ground, you know, making a game based on the movie using the title? So, like Sleeping Dogs colon whatever it may be. I have a lot of uh, different conversations with the, so many, so many people involved to a point where to, let me just get this movie going first. <laughs> Because it's like, you know, uh, I don't want to lose my fire, this raging fire, I, where, where I still have a bit, you know, we still have with sleeping dogs. And I think I can, I can really uh, 
I think it's going to be a really uh, uh, fun. I can vision, uh, vis visualize the, the 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 whole look of this film. It's going to be a it's going to be something very special. But let me just focus on getting this film made first. You are obviously in Berlin filming Wick. I'm not sure if you're a part of the photography that's going to the other countries, but after you wrap on Wick, um, do you already know what you're doing over like, you know, for the next year? Or are you sort of like, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna spend time with my family and then I'll figure things out. I was, of course I have need to spend time with my family, but I, I'm not sure if I want to be away from my family by filming away from my family more, uh, anymore. Like no, no, no farther than maybe a hundred miles, you know, <laughs> you know, where I could drive home. I have some. I have some. A couple of uh, projects lined up, in, which has been postponed, not postponed, but kind of fixed my schedule to fit John Wick's in. So when I go back, of course, I'm going to spend time. You know, Christmas and holidays. I want to be with my kids and my wife. I'm a workaholic. You know, when I my project is always there, and there's there's a couple of big projects next year, and like I said, one of them is Sleeping Dog. My last thing for you, you have crafted a number of action sequences, which is the one through your career that you still have nightmares about, which is the one that really taxed you to pull off? Oh man, there's so many of them. There's so many of them, I tell you. Well, not, I honestly can't say every, but nine and a half out of 10 action movies that I've been. It is, I'm hard on myself. I always want to take it to the next level or always trying to push myself to, what can I do this time that top the last one? Not necessarily I succeeded because that is a perspective from audiences, right? To, to give answers, but at least I, I give it a shot. I give it a try. So when you have that kind of expectation and kind of, hard on yourself. Even the simplest, simplest uh, little fight scenes could be the hardest because you're trying to be perf perfect in every little detail, you know? You know what I'm saying? But there's a couple of unforgettable moments that I can share with you that is crazy, crazy. Let me share with you one, Monkey King. People might not like, they didn't like the CGI in there. But I tell you, when I did Monkey King, it was the first time we used the 3D camera. It was a gigantic monster. We didn't know what to do with it. It was an experiment for everybody. We had a team of prosthetic makeup artists from Hollywood. And they were trying different things on my body. I remember the first month of shooting. I need to put makeup on. I have to sit on a chair every day for five and a half to six hours, every single day. So they give me this big giant chair with music on. I'm just sleep in my chair. Putting all these pieces of hair, I'm not talking about the suits, right? I'm talking about the ball cap and then this big piece of hair and everything until my foley like a monkey. And then obviously you can't eat. You can't go to the bathroom. You got a little zipper there. If you want to go through the big one, that's a problem, right? And we can only drink water, so you can't really. So in the first two weeks, I didn't know what to do of my acting because it was so hard to move my face. I need to experiment my, my facial expression. I have to really enlarge them to make this facial expression. So trying to get into character. And, and I did a lot of my research. I did some research on how to play this Monkey King because Monkey King was based on not only from a Chinese myth mythologies and also Beijing opera. So my takes was, you know, I'm gonna try to take it, it a little bit of here and there, right? Based on some Beijing opera, some, uh, and I at, literally went to the zoo and study monkeys in cages and see how they react, you know, from uh, Planet of the Apes, those movies, and some Beijing opera and some just, you know, the way I tackle the character. And it was so tiring, both the situation I was in and moving as a monkey, because when you're moving, 
everything, when you're moving the, at the Monkey King, everything has to be a twist. There's a difference between the way I play the Monkey King opposed to, say, Stephen Child in Monkey King. Stephen Child played the Monkey King in a more of a laid back kind of cool idea. Like this. But the way I portrayed the Monkey King, first of all, that story is the beginning of Monkey King, when he, how he grew up from a baby and becomes a monkey. And I took that banana, a lot of, and ate the banana like, a, like, a, like what a monkey did, right? There was a lot of improvisation, obviously, on, on the set. But it's playing the monkey in the very energetic and twisting and explosive way, bending my knee, scroll, crawling to John Fott. You speak of John Fott when I walk to John Fott and acting with him. When he can be, when, it, when he can say a line with a relaxed gesture, posing, standing, I have to twist it. I have to talk funny. It was so tiring, every take. And when you, when at the end of the day, you got to take out the outfits. The outfits, I probably lost about two, every day, five pounds every day because I'm sweating inside, sweat, and an hour and a half removing the makeup. And not only that, I was the action director. We had a, we had a studio, two studio, studio A for all the drivers. Then I have to go to the green, uh, studio two right next door, like, like literally right next to each other with my whole monkey suit directing all the action scene. And I'll be sitting there with my monkey suit and with my microphone and with my um, uh, with speaker microphone and cursing and screaming and yelling and uh, get this screen, this and that. And I remember, I was the actor and John Fah, Joe and Fah was acting and Aaron Kwok was acting. When John and Fah came, I got to skip all the shots and I got to shoot John and Fah first because his contract only was uh, only on the set for six hours. And in two hours, he would go around shaking people's hand. So only have John and Fah for four hours. So I said, oh, brother Fat, come on, let's get, get you in this acting, get you in the shoot. So I can only shoot him for a couple hours. So I got to skip all the shots with my monkey suit on, shoot him. Right? Then after him, then Aaron Clark comes in and play the, the old king. Shoot him. Then at the end of the day, I only have two hours left shoot, shooting myself, shooting all the action. Then I have to run back to the Studio A to do drama. So it's the most stressful, tiring, physically, both mentally and physically uh, task. That was one. The other one, I'll quickly tell you, when I did Bodyguards and Assassins, when I fought Kung Lee at the end, you know, I have the ball caps on, and to see uh, some prosthetic when I get beat up. And I was also the action director. I was the action director for the end scenes where I, you know, the action director in Hong Kong is basically, basically a director. So I can take, I, and I shot the biggest scene at the finale where there was 600, more than 600 extra, five cameras going, where I have full on prosthetic makeup, like broken nose, broken eyes, and everything, right? It was a, during summer, July, the middle of July, with like literally 30 something degrees, right? So hot and humid. And I was yelling and screaming with a mic and telling the, 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 the audience, right? Out there, ah, oh, come on, move this over here, 80, you know, shoot this and, you know, do all that. While I'm choreographing and with my stunt team, do this, do this, shoot this. And I'll tell you the hardest part wasn't that. The hardest part was there was mosquitoes. Thousands of mosquitoes biting the hell out of you. I was shooting for freaking 24 hours nonstop because I have to finish the set. And I promised the director and producer, ben, Peter Chan and Teddy Chan, I got to finish that. Because at the end, we didn't have a lot of time left, right? We have to rush, finish the uh, set, finish the film. So there was a couple of guys. Uh, 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 Peter Chan would take the, uh, one, uh, one, one scene and he would shoot the scenes. And then Teddy Chan will shoot these scenes. And then uh, 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 Andrew Lau, who helped out in other action scenes, have shoot that scene. And I took on the biggest fight scene, which involved 600 uh, extra. So we were collaborating in that, in that kind of setting, right? So the mosquito was biting through my outfit. Like there were hundreds of mosquito bites through my outfit. I couldn't, I couldn't scratch it. I was like, fight it. And I was sweating and inside was heated. And and then I hurt my back and I couldn't walk. And that's, that's just two of the very, I can tell you a thousand story. This is just maybe until next time, this is the, just the corner of a. Yeah, I don't think. One day I'll tell you more crazy, crazy story, crazy story. I was gonna say, I don't think people, a lot of people truly don't realize 
what it takes to craft movies and action and what really goes on behind the scenes. Because I think a lot of people from the outside, it's very glamorous. You're a movie star. You know, you're, you know, they just see the end product, but they don't realize that it's, you know, six months or so, you know, they don't really maybe understand. No, it's, it's every shoot was a hard shoot. When I did it, man, the first one, I couldn't move both of my arms. People think, oh, Daniel with the chain punch, with the wing chun and everything. Every take, if you poke me with a finger, I would be jumping with pain. It was so bad. Both of my arms inside had inflammation because I was punching so many times every take that in the end of the day, I couldn't lift my arms. And when I was fighting, I had to change my choreography from like the choreography was right side, this side, right? Then I couldn't lift up my right hand. The action director was Samuel Hong. So I said, uh, 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 big brother Samuel, can I change everything? So I can't lift my arms. Can I, let me change all the movements to the left hand. So a lot of these <laughs> situations where people would never guess in a million years what happened during this, during those takes, you know? I'm gonna stop there because you've given me so much time and I could keep asking you questions and I know we could talk the entire day, but um, but I'm going to stop there. And I'm just going to say sincerely, really appreciate you talking so much with me. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time as well.